Honored to introduce our keynote speaker today, Karenna Gore. Uh, Karenna is the director of the Center for Earth Ethics at Union Theological Seminary here in uh, nearby in Morningside, Morningside Heights. In 2014, Ms. Gore organized the conference Religions for the Earth, which brought together more than 200 spiritual and religious leaders to examine the role of faith in addressing climate crisis. From there, she founded the Center for Earth Ethics, which reframes climate change as a moral issue. The center brings religious and environmental leaders together to drive change at the local, national, and global level, particularly for low-income communities, which are especially vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. She received an MA in Social Ethics from Union, a JD from Columbia Law School, and her BA from Harvard University. She's the author of the book, Lighting the Way, Nine Women Who Changed Modern America. One of those women was Alice Hamilton, who's considered actually uh, the founder of the field of occupational medicine. She was a Harvard physician known for her work on environmental exposures and the effects of industrial toxins, and really started the field in the early 20th century. In fact, one of my predecessors, uh, Dr. Irving Selikoff, founded the Division of Environmental and Occupational Medicine here at Mount Sinai in 1966, greatly admired Dr. Hamilton, and was known to have said, science is not sufficient, understanding that there is a moral imperative to educate and seek policy change. In that spirit, we renamed our department to Environmental Medicine and Public Health to illustrate how connected the two must be. So I'm very delighted that Ms. Gore is here today to teach us how to bridge those ideas through faith and spirituality, to improve the health of our communities and patients in the face of climate crisis. And her talk today is entitled, Healthcare in the Time of Climate Crisis, an Earth Ethics Perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am honored to be here. Thank you for inviting me to be with you today. Thank you to the Institute for, the Ex for Exposomic Research at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai for convening us. I am indeed the founder and director of the Center for Earth Ethics at Union Theological Seminary. We draw from the world's faith and wisdom traditions to confront the ecological crisis, and we work through education, convening, and movement building. Religion is relevant to climate change work in a few ways. One is that religious identity drives behavior in much of the world. At its best, religion can call people to values that transcend politics. There is organizing power and reach in faith communities. As in the civil rights movement, moral language and communal cultural strength can inspire breakthroughs for social change. People also often turn to spirituality in times of loss, and faith communities are often at the forefront of disaster relief efforts, helping people to make sense of what has happened and act in service to help their neighbors. Interfaith dialogue can discern values that are held in common across different doctrines and even unmask some of the belief systems embedded in mainstream secular society. For all these reasons, the Center for Earth Ethics takes religion seriously, but is not forwarding one particular religious viewpoint. We are working on an ethical framework for our ecological crisis. Ethics becomes particularly important in times when the laws, when morality is out of step with the laws and norms of society. So it is today. The climate crisis is unfolding and those that will suffer most are those least likely to have a voice, the poor, marginalized, and most vulnerable peoples of the world, including elderly, young children, and the infirm, all future generations, and all non-human life. Those laws and norms that facilitate this system and hasten this trajectory are upheld by entrenched political power and financial interests. They also reflect deeply held beliefs or illusions that prevent people from grasping reality and responding to it. I'm not a medical professional and I'm eager to learn from those of you who are but I do want to talk about ethics in the larger sense of the term, how to avoid doing harm and how to heal. I will focus my remarks on insights from my field and connect them to clinical health care as best I can. We live in an extraordinary time in the midst of an existential crisis that seems to have crept up on us. 
Since the Industrial Revolution, humans have been digging and burning the oil, coal, and gas in the earth at an ever-increasing pace, releasing emissions that are called greenhouse gases because of the heat-trapping effect in the thin shell of our atmosphere. Warnings from scientists go as far back as the 19th century, but have, been, have become more specific, thoroughly researched, and urgent, culminating in the recent reports from the International Panel on Climate Change, known as the IPCC. Their 2018 report concluded that in order to limit the temperature rise to 1.5 degrees over pre-industrial averages, which is what they have deemed relatively manageable to adapt to, we need to act decisively to curb emissions by about 45% from 2010 levels by 2030 within the next 12 years. According to the math, it means we have 10 years left to make those changes in all sectors of society, including buildings, transport, industry, and land use. What it really means is that every unit and aspect of time is of the essence. And even to meet the less desirable target of a two degree rise, we must act right now. At the same time, there has been rampant deforestation and soil depletion, removing critical carbon sinks as well as destroying habitat for other species, whole interconnected webs of plant and animal life. Who knows how many untapped potential medicines we are destroying unwittingly. It must be said that this is habitat for some humans as well. I was born in 1973. In my lifetime alone, the human population has doubled while the wild animal population has been cut in half. 40% of wetlands have been lost, half the coral reefs have died, and we've destroyed half the world's forests. In this same time period, there have been lifestyle changes aided by technologies that, for all their benefits, have also brought about things like the phenomenon of screen time and the proliferation of waste, especially single-use plastics. It often feels as if the world is in shock. There's a joke, what's the difference between an optimist and a pessimist? The pessimist says, I just can't imagine how things could get much worse. And the optimist says, oh, I think I can. <laughs> so how did we get here? The main way that society measures success, economic metrics like GDP, gross domestic product, do not count some pretty striking things depletion of resources, pollution, inequality, the spread of disease, or the long-term benefit of positive actions like conservation. The argument has been that short-term economic growth is good for the well-being of all, and we needn't concern ourselves with the so-called externalities. We needn't worry if the products bought and sold are harmful as long as there are more of them. We needn't worry about long-term consequences or aggregate effects as long as the jobs numbers look good and the stock market is up. We now face a reckoning. The UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, Philip Alston, issued a detailed report last year which stated, climate change threatens to undo the last 50 years of progress in development, global health, and poverty reduction. On December 19th, researchers from the Climate Impact Lab, who are working on precise data-driven estimates to project future impacts, recently told the House of Representatives Oversight Committee that their main finding to date is that, quote, the increase in global mortality rate due to climate change-induced temperature changes in 2100 is larger than the current mortality rate for all infectious diseases. And this is only a fraction of what will come if we continue on the path we are on. Of course, even with one degree warming, in some parts of the globe, it's a bit more, we see now stronger storms, exacerbated floods, more severe heat waves, melting ice and permafrost, rising sea levels, raging wildfires, worsened droughts, droughts, seasonal weather disruption, and the like, including the ongoing fires in Australia right now that have killed 32 people since September, including, sadly, three Americans yesterday 
who were piloting a tanker plane to drop fire retardant on the flames. It is also estimated that these fires have killed one billion animals. Healthcare professionals are on the front lines of this crisis, not only because you treat people who are hurt and suffering and diagnose and strategize and communicate about how to manage risks that affect whole populations, but because we have a planetary health problem that we as a whole have not been able to fully grasp. Many have used analogies involving doctors in trying to explain what is happening. Climate scientist Catherine Hayhoe has said the Earth is running a fever, pointing out that a thermometer is not conservative or liberal, Democrat or Republican. One public intellectual said that we should understand our situation as caretakers of a patient who has symptoms of sickness, and having sought multiple opinions, we have found out that the vast consensus is that the patient is suffering from a serious progressive disease called anthropogenic climate change. One political re leader reached for this analogy a few months ago that illustrates the problem with the gap between the process of treating a patient and the current process of our self-government. Congress right now, he said, is like a room full of doctors arguing about what to do over a cancer patient, and half of them are arguing over whether medication or surgery is the best approach, and the other half is saying cancer doesn't exist. Needless to say, we need more of the kind of disciplined thinking that comes from actual real-life doctors to come to our aid. Today, we will learn more about the way that climate change impacts affect human health, from the injury and trauma associated with extreme weather events, to disease vectors, to issues around hydration and nutrition, to the physiological effects of extreme heat. I have visited some communities impacted already, such as a community in Lowndes County, Alabama, where a combination of poverty, raw sewage on the ground, rising heat and more rainfall have created a haven for disease. As a study by the National School of Tropical Medicine at Baylor College confirmed a couple of years ago, there is a resurgence of hookworm and a significant risk of the advent of tropical diseases not known in that region before. There are also healthcare concerns on the other end of these impacts. The same activity that is the primary cause of the disruption in our Earth's atmosphere, the extraction and burning of fossil fuels, also causes ambient pollution that harms human health in the communities where these toxic sites are located. For example, I visited Belews Creek in North Carolina, which is inundated with coal ash and suffers high cancer and asthma rates. For years, people there were told that cancer ran in their family, but now they're making the connection and fighting back. Soon, I plan to visit St. James, Louisiana, where a giant petrochemical company, Formosa, is planning a $90 billion mega complex in an overwhelmingly African-American community that has already suffered from the health impacts of literally dozens of other such plants that are already there in that region, so much so that the region has been dubbed Death Alley. Some people talk about social services in the time of climate change by emphasizing adaptation. But if all these activities are continued and expanded, if more coal plants are built and, oil, and more oil and gas fracking and drilling is done and emissions continue to rise as they have this past year, there will be no end point of climate impacts to adapt to, no static point of what healthcare will look like in an altered environment. It will just get exponentially worse. So one thing I want to emphasize is that healthcare in the time of climate crisis must be concerned with the level of cause as much as the level of effect. This way of thinking is quite familiar to those of you trained in preventative medicine, public health, and exposomics. We urgently need your insights and input in this global emergency. What is the deepest level of cause of the climate crisis? On September 19th, 2014, an essay titled Pursuit of the Common Good was published in the journal Science 
co-authored by an economist, Partha Dasgupta, and a climate scientist, Virabdan Ramanathan, that called for cross-disciplinary engagement in a difficult but infinitely worthwhile task. Quote, over and above institutional reforms and policy changes that are required, they wrote, there is a need to reorient our attitude towards nature and thereby towards ourselves. I want to explore what this means for clinical settings, but first I would like to offer some suggestions about our collective relationship to nature now. There was a moment years ago when the CEO of a large fossil fuel company said something interesting. His contention was that fossil fuel driven economic development was alleviating human suffering, part of the fallacy of the economic growth paradigm we have already considered was part of that impression. And when pressed about the problem that his business plan was going to lead to global ecological collapse, he said, what good is it to save the planet if humanity suffers? The obvious response to that is, well, so we have some place to live. Another response is that actually, if we do not mitigate climate change, the suffering will be unimaginable. But those responses are not even quite fully adequate to deal with the mistaken way of thinking he gave voice to. And it is not just him. How is it that so many people have come to think that the earth, air, water, soil, other species of life is simply a backdrop or a set of resources rather than integral to our bodies and our lives? Part of this problem is theological. Some say it goes all the way back to Plato, who posited a separation between matter and spirit, referred to as dualism, that threaded on through European thinkers such as Rene Descartes and Francis Bacon. Others say it is based on a bad translation of the concept of dominion in the book of Genesis and a distortion of the concept of imago Dei, that human beings and only human beings are created in the image of God. In that same vein, a clue might be found in the conversion of the Roman Emperor Constantine to Christianity in the early fourth century precipitating the marriage of institutional Christianity to empire and colonization. This had a big impact on wiping out animistic spirituality that saw aspects of nature as sacred, which made it a lot easier to think of rivers and forests and mountaintops as objects and resources rather than living beings. Imperial forces like to extract resources and control local populations, and it helps to promote a belief system amenable to that. In 1967, a medieval historian named Lynn White wrote a paper called Historical Roots of Our Ecological Crisis, in which he claimed that, quote, the victory of Christianity over paganism was the biggest psychic revolution in the history of our culture. This is not a comment on the essence of the Christian faith, by the way. It is simply an observation of the effect of this convergence of forces. Then, in the 15th century, when the Vatican issued decrees, papal bulls, they were called, that proclaimed the land and the peoples of the Americas and Africa should be conquered, vanquished, and subdued by European Christian explorers, this mentality was instilled in the beginning of the European people's presence in the land that we are in right now. In fact, Pope Alexander VI's decree even explicitly stated that non-Christian peoples of these lands, meaning everyone there at the time, was part of the flora and fauna to be subdued. The dehumanization of people of color and the sense of license to pillage the natural world were linked. And judging from the amount of environmental injustice and racism there is now, the number one indicator of the placement of a toxic facility in this country is the race of those who live nearby. It still is linked. As far as Christian theology is concerned, there is a lot of work being done to redress this particular doc doctrinal mistake. In 2015, Pope Francis published an encyclical 
a teaching entitled Laudato Si, On Care for Our Common Home, which is devoted to the concept of integral ecology. A quote from paragraph 116. An inadequate presentation of Christian anthropology gave rise to a wrong understanding of the relationship between human beings and the world. Often, what was handed on was a Promethean vision of mastery over the world, which gave the impression that the protection of nature was something that only the faint-hearted cared about. Instead, our dominion over the universe should be understood more properly in the sense of responsible stewardship. More people are also recognizing that the wisdom of indigenous peoples is powerful, especially as a counterforce to the chain of events we have set in place. Several teachings from indigenous peoples of this land come to mind. One from the Iroquois is that every important decision made today should be made with seven generations ahead in mind. There is also the concept of reciprocity with nature, that as we take, we must also give, even, and perhaps especially, if that is in the form of conscious acknowledgement and respect. This contrast in belief systems was evident at the conflict at Standing Rock. I was able to be there, but I will quote the, write, the writer Walter Kern to give you a sense of what it was like. It is not a romantic or fanciful event, but an earnest and passionate spiritual intervention by people for whom spirit and matter are not separate categories at all, but a living interpenetrating unity their immediate concern is with a pipeline capable of fouling the local waters with toxic oil from the nearby fracking fields. Their larger concern is with a mad philosophy that pits human beings against their natural home for vain and temporary benefits." End quote. The native peoples at Standing Rock said, we are not protesters, we are protectors they marched behind a banner that said, defend the sacred. The term water protector became widespread and the term sky protector has begun to be used as well. This is one example of a reorientation of our attitude towards nature. The pioneering environmental scientist, Rachel Carson wrote, those who contemplate the beauty of the earth find reserves of strength that will endure as long as life lasts. There is something infinitely healing in the repeated refrains of nature, the assurance that dawn comes after night and spring after winter. There is now a lot of new research confirming that exposure and immersion in nature is beneficial to health. A study published in the Journal of the American Heart Association in 2018 found that exposure to the natural world lowers the risk of cardiovascular disease by reducing stress. The government of Japan promotes the practice of shinrin-yoku, or forest bathing, because of its proven health benefits. As one Jap Japanese doctor has put it, this is not exercise or hiking or jogging. It is simply being in nature, connecting with it through our senses of sight, hearing, taste, smell, and touch. Some of this might seem more in the category of common sense, but the medical research and recommendations are helping people to take it seriously. According to the EPA, the average American spends over 90% of their life indoors. And we know that an ever-increasing amount of that time is devoted to screens. In 2003, a book called Last Child in the Woods by Richard Louv coined the term nature deficit disorder, sparking a wave of mainstream cultural inquiry into the effect of nature on health, which has included books such as The Nature Fix. Some of the ensuing discourse seems to dwell on the lack of specificity of cause and effect and seeks to identify micro hacks of nature to shortcut the benefits with maximum efficiency. I think of the words of one of my favorite theologians, Howard Thurman, an African-American Baptist and mystic who was a significant influence on Martin Luther King Jr. He was Boston University's Mar Dean of Boston University's Marsh Chapel when King was a student there, and he wrote an extraordinary book called Jesus and the Disinherited, which King carried around with him for some time. Thurman wrote, 
Man cannot long separate himself from nature without withering as a cut rose in a vase. And he posited that the modern, many modern mental and emotional disorders, as he put it, resulted from the deranging effect of sensing that we collectively have, have of being rootless and vagabond and of fouling our own nest. This community has long been aware of the connection between the realm of the physical and the realm of the mental and emotional. The Climate Psychiatry Alliance states that mental health is profoundly impacted by the disruptions associated with climate change and has created a forum to bring psychiatrists together to have a collective voice on this issue. Of course, this includes trauma from extreme weather events and the stress-inducing effects of extreme heat and the like, but there is a growing body of work around mental health and climate in a more broad sense. In 2017, the American Psychological Association endorsed a body of research identifying eco-anxiety. Dr. Lise Van Susteren uses the term pre-traumatic stress disorder. Many people are now discussing the phenomenon of climate grief, brought on by the sense of the current loss of biodiversity, empathy for those suffering, suffering and from the climate impacts that are already here, as well as the recognition that the future looks much different than we had imagined, and that we may have saddled our children with an unspeakable burden. This is a real mental health issue, and it is one that religious and spiritual leaders are dealing with as well. We all need the best clinical research and insights to draw from. To return to the theme of concerning ourselves with the level of cause, as well as effect, consider this. The American Psychological Association also stated, to compound the issue, the psychological responses to climate change, such as conflict avoidance, fatalism, fear, helplessness, and resignation, are growing. These responses are keeping us and our nation from properly addressing the core causes of and solutions for our changing climate and from building and supporting psychological resiliency." End quote. Not only is the climate crisis causing mental health issues, but it seems that our failure to respond to the climate crisis is itself a mental health issue. After all, half the global warming pollution in the atmosphere right now has been put up there in the last 20 years, the time we have mo known the most about this. Metaphors of addiction and suicide are hard to avoid. Clinical insights about preventing and treating all these maladies are not incidental to our ability to solve the climate crisis. Here again, connection to nature has proven therapeutic. I would suggest that this may be especially true if there is an establishment of reciprocity with nature rather than resource extraction. A sense of belonging is reciprocal and powerful and hard to fake. The trauma theorist Bessel van der Kolk has written that, quote, safe connections are fundamental to meaningful and satisfying lives. Perhaps in the time of climate crisis, that insight can also be applied to the connections of humans to nature, as well as to each other. In the book Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants, Robin Wall Kimmerer writes, restoring land without restoring our relationship is an empty exercise. It is relationship that will endure and relationship that will sustain the restored land. Therefore, connecting people and the landscape is as essential as reestablishing proper hydrology or cleaning up contaminants. It is medicine for the earth. We could add to that. It is also medicine for humanity. In addition to reconnecting to nature, there's a bit of hardcore public health advocacy work that needs to be done. In this situation, surely the call to heal must include a duty to warn. One of my favorite figures in American history is Dr. Alice Hamilton, who was active 100 years ago in the aftermath of World War I. Thank you for mentioning her, Dr. Raid. 
The American Public Health Association, one of our other co-hosts today, which does such wonderful work, gives an award in her name every year. She was an expert in what was termed industrial medicine, at a time when toxins such as lead and mercury were poisoning workers in factories, and there was no precedent for preventative measures or government oversight or regulation. Indeed, there was a sense that anything that interrupted the industrial juggernaut of the early 20th century was somehow anti-American. With a combination of meticulous research, moral reasoning, and skilled advocacy, she was among those that achieved the first protocols, laws, and policies for occupational medicine. Incidentally, in 1919, Hamilton was named the first woman faculty member of Harvard University. And it was not because they were looking for a woman. In fact, they made stipulations that she couldn't belong to the faculty club, she couldn't be at commencement, and she could not have any football tickets. But it was because she was the preeminent figure in a new and critical field. Hamilton explained that qualified male scientists had rejected this field because it was, quote, tainted with socialism or with feminine sentimentality for the poor. This, too, is something for us to be aware of, the notion of a taint. Some of the most essential approaches in clinical climate work may initially be treated in a similar way. And of course, it is combined with the inevitable pushback from those with a financial stake in the status quo. Be as unintimidated as Alice Hamilton was in protecting workers in factories. Today, the so-called externalities of our industrial society have increased to the point that they threaten the future of human civilization. Chemical companies and the political leaders that they donate to are leading efforts to roll back protections from the toxic chemicals like the ones Alice Hamilton and Rachel Carson and others fought for. The federal government is pushing out scientists who are telling the truth about climate change and even removing the mention of it from public documents. We need a public health campaign like never seen before. And I applaud those in this community that are already rising to the challenge. I hope that this talk has been helpful in some way. I know that your work is noble and necessary and hard, even in the best of times. Thank you for listening to the perspective that I bring from Earth Ethics and being open to the way that it intersects with healthcare. This is no ordinary time, and we are together in not knowing how it will all turn out. As the Buddhist teacher Joanna Macy has put it, the insights and experience that enable us to make this shift may arise from grief for our world that contradicts the illusions of the separate and isolated self, or they may arise from breakthroughs in science, such as quantum physics and systems theory, or we may find ourselves inspired by the wisdom traditions of native peoples and mystical voices in the major religions saying that our world is a sacred whole in which we have a sacred mission. When it comes to matters of life and death, doctors and other healthcare professionals have unique respect and authority in our society. We need you to warn and we need you to heal. We need you to be aware of the climate crisis in your individual practice, particularly as you treat the poor, the elderly, and the children who, were, who will bear a disproportionate burden, but also in your work among people of all backgrounds. We are interconnected, and the current trajectory of the climate crisis is a force that would ultimately spare no one. Solving it should be a unifying cause. We all breathe air, we all drink water, we all eat food that grows in soil. We are the earth. Let's trade the illusions of externalities for the reality of exposomics, the harm of mere extraction for the healing of reciprocity. And let's get this done. Thank you.